June 1911. In the Belfast shipyard, the slipways were empty for the first time in over two years. Titanic was finally in the water. She was still an empty shell, waiting for carpenters, engineers, and painters to transform her into a luxurious liner. Meanwhile, her sister ship, Olympic, was on her maiden voyage to New York. Chief designer Thomas Andrews was eager for news. At last, a wire from Olympic for Mr. Ismay. He's raised some real concerns about the ship. The springs in the mattresses are too soft, and there's a lack of cigarette holders in the WCs. Also, we are short of a potato peeler. Well done, Tommy. Well done. Even as Titanic's slipway was being cleared, there was another sign of tragedy to come. James Dobbin, age 43, was fatally injured by falling timbers. He died the next day. Titanic had been towed to the fitting out wharf. With just 10 months before she was scheduled to sail, much work remained. and boilers, decking and lighting, furnishings and paintings, all had to be fitted into place. Anchors and mooring posts were brought in from England and Scotland, as were basins and baths, and cranes for the 16 lifeboats. It was the yard's own foundry that produced the major castings and heavy equipment for the engines and turbines, as they now found their place in the belly of the great ship. Artists, some brought from Italy, produced the fine detail and embossed panels for the interior of the first-class staterooms. Also in the months ahead, the Guarantee Group would be chosen. Eight exceptional workers rewarded with passage on Titanic's maiden voyage. A highly coveted honor. How were they to know what lay ahead? I'll tell you something, Liam Flaherty. What's that, Mr. Honey? I think you're on your way to being a half-decent shipwright. You should tell my dad that. Yeah, it is, Dave. I mentioned it to a few other people, though. Mr. Cumming, the gaffer, for example. Well, that's good of you, Mr. Moore. I might have done you a bigger favor than you think. Why is that? He's been asked by Mr. Andrews to recommend a shipwright and an apprentice to go on Titanic's maiden voyage. You don't mean he's thinking of recommending you and me? Thinking of is as far as it goes at the moment, Liam. grand vision for the most luxurious liner the world had ever seen was coming to life. But to those who built her, Titanic was already a ship of dreams. Would you look at her, Alfie? Titanic's magnificent. Did we really build all this? You, me, and one or two more. She didn't build herself, that's for sure. But isn't she grand? Solid, like she's always been here, and always will be. Maybe she's too good for the likes of us now, though. Eh, Liam? Then, disaster. Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, was torn open in a collision with a Royal Navy cruiser, the HMS Hawk. The armor-plated bow of the naval vessel tore a 12-foot gash in Olympic side, damaging 11 of her massive steel plates and her propulsion system, too. Repairs were estimated at a quarter of a million pounds, about $30 million today. The impact was also felt back in Belfast, where Titanic was now almost complete. The man responsible for Olympic's damage was Captain Edward Smith. 
who would soon skipper the Titanic. The captain of HMS Hawk, quite simply, got too close and lost control. There were growing fears that these liners were becoming monster ships, too big to be handled safely. And it's plain from the photographs which vessel came off worse. But Titanic's builders were masters at spin control. That Olympic comfortably survived the collision. Consider what would have happened to any other vessel which had suffered such severe damage. Say the Mauritania. <laughs> As water flooded in, her poor crewmen would have scurried around frantically trying to close the doors between all her separate compartments and stem the flow. A vain endeavor. But we at Harland and Wolf, gentlemen, have introduced automatic watertight doors. A simple flick of the switch suffices to seal the entire ship and render her safe. Much had been made of the watertight doors, a design that Harland and Wolf actually Olympics borrowed from a German rival. What was undeniable was that they worked. As soon as water is detected in the ship, an electric switch is automatically thrown, causing all the bulkhead doors throughout the ship to close at once. Mr. Frost. I should come to this side of the door, Mr. Green. <laughs> or you may get very wet. <laughs> there we are. Home and dry. With her automatic doors in place, Olympic had stayed afloat, even with two compartments completely flooded. So this, in your view, makes the ship what? Unsinkable? Captain Smith had long argued exactly that. I cannot conceive of any vital disaster happening to this vessel. Modern shipping has simply gone beyond that. Look, if there's a ship safer, we don't know of it. As far as I'm concerned, she is practically unsinkable. Practically unsinkable was the phrase used to sell this ship. To most, this meant she was safe. When Olympic survived, it seemed to prove that point. But soon, Titanic's completion schedule would take a fatal hit.